want a war? You're gonna get one. Knock it the gods with the trust From my generation, I'll take the fall The saints, the cross the nation And it's a sex, the gods, the freaks, the frogs The mess here with me Welcome to the final Reliving the War of 1996. It's the 30th of December, WCW Nitro is live from Knoxville, Tennessee, and WWF Raw is also live tonight from the Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York. We have a bit of an odd one here as Nitro tried to stuff in as many segments and matches as possible, meaning a few bouts don't even make it to the 3 minute mark. So you'll see WWF Raw matches or promos sometimes go up against two Nitro matches or promos, it's just the way it is. Let's get started then with a look at Nitro's first 60 minutes. If you missed the Starcade 1996 review, then you should see a link on your screen right now. Go check it out and come back because Nitro is pretty much all about what happened at the pay per view last night. Nitro starts off with the NW arriving at the arena, and Hulk isn't annoyed about getting beat last night at Starcade. Hollywood is still the champion, and the title is still in the NWO. The Giant takes a good look at the WCW Championship as the New World Order brag about being at the top of the mountain, and finally, the big man reminds Hogan that he's in line for a title shot after winning the World War 3 Battle Royal. Hogan reminds Giant that he dropped the ball last night at Starcade, and the Giant's title shot is being used to buy the NWO some time. As long as the belt is on Hulk Hogan, then everything is cool. Giant says he wants a chance to be the lead dog as Ted DiBiase tells the cameraman to go away, so it looks like there might be a problem within the NWO. The Amazing French Canadians, no not the Quebecers, the Amazing French Canadians defeated Public Enemy to kick off the in-ring action. Public Enemy sent themselves through a table and the French Canadians capitalised with a Quebec crash. A short match just like last week's effort. Ultimo Dragon then took on Jushin Lager as WCW made the most of Lager's stay in the United States. A fantastic contest here that saw Dragon get the win with a tagger suplex. Big Bubba was supposed to take on Conan next in a strap match but old Diamond Hands comes out and he tells Conan that Bubba couldn't make it to Nitro. So we have Wall Street vs Conan instead. Conan won the match in the end by falling into the fourth and final turnbuckle. Nothing special at all here really, you expect a little more from a strap match. Hulk Hogan cut a promo next and he and Eric Bischoff are acting a little delusional tonight. Both men are talking like Hogan beat Piper at Starcade last night while the commentary team call Hogan and Bischoff liars. Hogan said he showed a little mercy to Piper at Starcade when one of Piper's kids begged him to go easy. But now that Piper has been defeated by Hulk, the hot rod is gone. Piper took a beating last night apparently, and he's now left the company. The fans of WCW will never see Rowdy Roddy Piper ever again. Tony Schiavone is taken back by the lies being told in the ring, and after the next matchup, the commentary team make a point of showing fans at home some screenshots of Starcade, where Piper stands over a fallen Hulk Hogan. Before this was shown we had a Hugh Morris vs Kensuke Sasaki match, some nice power moves were on display here but it ended in a DQ. Morris hits the no laughing matter moonsault and then Sonny Ono jumped into the ring to nail Morris with a Japanese flag. Harlem Heat took on the faces of fear next, and the amazing French Canadians along with Colonel Robert Parker came out during the match. Robert Parker smacked Sherry on the butt with his riding crop, and this causes Sherry to see red. While Sherry attacks Parker, Jacques Rougeau throws powder at Stevie Ray, although Harlem Heat still managed to beat Ming and the Barbarian. Diamond Dallas Page looks incredibly annoyed when he gets interviewed by Mean Gene next. Remember Dallas lost his US title match against Eddie Guerrero thanks to the Outsiders. Okerlund wants to know what Page is going to do about his current problem, and Page just says he'll fix it. DDP doesn't give any more answers as Mean Gene presses the issue. He briefly comes back and he just says, the NWO. We have no idea what Page is talking about here, is he going to join the NWO, or is he going to fight the NWO? 
I'm giving this week's unopposed point to Raw. Out of the 5 matches we just saw, only the Lager vs Dragon match comes recommended. The rest were instantly forgettable. WWF Raw starts off with a hype video for tonight's face to face meeting between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Bret says he's been waiting a long time for the opportunity to tell Shawn how he really feels, while Shawn says there's no excuses tonight. The role model of the WWF will go face to face with the WWF's favourite Degenerate. I thought it was interesting that Shawn was calling himself a Degenerate as early as December 1996. Our opening Raw match is quite interesting, Steve Austin teams up with Farouk to take on Jesse James and Savio Vega, while over on Nitro we've got… Ah, fuck's sake, Glacier vs Disco Inferno. Glacier takes himself away for weeks and now we can't get rid of the bitterly cold bastard. Everything's all serious as Austin and Farouk make their way down to the ring but then out comes the real Double J to ruin everything with his country singing. Steve Austin says nah fuck that and James gets attacked on the entranceway. Savio then runs out for the save and our match gets underway. Stone Cold gets rammed into the ring steps by Vega before the two competitors get into the ring. Austin manages to hit a stun gun and I like Vega's cell job here. Good stuff. Stone Cold tags in Farouk and Vega takes a spine buster and here to save you from rewinding the video, here's a replay. Ooh. Farouk then teases his opponent by extending Vega's arm out to Jesse James before delivering more punishment to Savio. Savio turns it around by getting a boot up in the corner followed by a heel kick and then we see Bret Hart watching the match backstage. The brightness on that 4K HDR monitor must be absolutely cranked to the max because the hitman needs sunglasses to watch along. Stone Cold gets tagged back in and he stumps a mud hole in Savio. The referee gets distracted by John Jones in the opposite corner so Farouk gets in a few cheap shots too. Savio then tries to catch Austin with a pin attempt but Austin kicks out and Savio takes a clothesline. Another standing heel kick helps Savio to buy some time, Savio tries to reach Double J, Austin grabs his leg, Savio then hits an enziguri and the tag is made. Check out the absolute lack of crowd reaction when James finally comes into the match. From behind, actually before the match officially began by Stone Cold and now, yeah. James goes to work on Austin, Stone Cold takes a flying forearm and a bulldog from the corner. Austin decides to tag out and this leads to Farouk taking a back body drop. James gets a little too confident and he throws himself out of the ring. Austin takes advantage by hitting a chop lock on James and as Steve Austin and Farouk celebrate their dirty work, the hitman Bret Hart comes down to the ringside area. Austin gets out of harm's way and Bret goes to check on Jesse James because you know they are really good friends and all that. It looks like James can't continue the match and Brett starts lobbying to get added to the bout as Jesse's replacement. We come back from a commercial break and yes, Brett is now teaming up with Savio Vega. This is what we call an upgrade. Farouk makes Brett reconsider his decisions by applying a lethal chin lock on Savio Vega and when Savio breaks the hold, Austin runs in to prevent Vega from tagging in Brett. Stone Cold gets officially tagged in and he applies another chin lock to Vega. Vega's chin has nearly fallen off at this point but he perseveres. Brett looks on as Savio is literally getting knocked out cold by the chin lock. The referee has to raise Vega's arm but Savio springs to life and when both men get back to their feet, a wild fist fight breaks out. And in comes Farouk to hit a power slam on Vega. Brett is now wishing he just watched this match on that ultra bright monitor backstage. Finally, Savio does some damage when Farouk takes an electric chair drop and here, let me remind you of something. Double J's hot tag. Officially began by Stone Cold and now. Yeah. And here's Bret Hart's hot tag. All he can do is accept it. The hitman takes care of both of his opponents. Russian leg sweep on Farouk. Second rope elbow drop. Bret goes for the sharpshooter and then Crush runs in to cause a DQ finish. All of that for fucking Crush to come down and the match gets thrown out. The Nation and Steve Austin attack Savio and Brett. Ahmed Johnson ends up coming down for the save and Ahmed begins a you're going down chant as he challenges Farouk to step into the ring for a preview of their Royal Rumble match. Have to point out Ahmed's tights here too. Beautiful. Good match, loads going on but it was ruined by the finish. 
Disco Inferno vs Glacier then, fucking hell, dancing on ice. Disco grabs a microphone and he says he's perfected his new leg hold finishing move. Glacier should just walk away and let the Disco Inferno dance with his audience tonight. Glacier declines Disco's generous offer, he's now made Disco mad, so our match gets underway with Glacier taking his opponent down with an arm drag, followed by a Japanese arm drag. The two fight over wrist control but Glacier gets the advantage and Disco takes Chub Zero's kick combo. Disco then makes his plan of attack known to everyone in the arena, he wants to lock in his new finisher, but Glacier doesn't give the Inferno any opportunities to apply the hold. Disco takes a leg sweep, Glacier then presses up and high kick, and we see more strikes from Glacier in the corner, Disco needs to reevaluate his strategy here. Glacier lines up the cryonic kick but Disco pulls the referee in between the competitors, good guy Glacier brings the referee to safety, and this allows Disco to turn our frosty friend inside out with a clothesline. Jacques Rougeau's black powder from earlier on has covered Disco's aluminous orange gear as Glacier takes a kicking on the mat. Disco then tells us that we're about to see his new finishing move, but Disco forgets how to apply it and he ends up taking a kick from Glacier. Look at how Glacier's leg stiffens up after the kick. Glacier tries to fight back but Disco hits a swinging neckbreaker. Disco then goes upstairs for a little dance, but Glacier kips up. We then see a great super kick from Glacier and as mentioned last week, this super kick would get renamed to the cryonic kick. And it's all over, Glacier wins via pinfall. Another point for WWF Raw, not gonna say I wasn't entertained by Chili McFreeze vs John Travolta, but the Raw match was just better. Triple H vs Flash Funk on Raw, Chris Jericho vs Chris Benoit on Nitro. As Flash Funk makes his way down to the ring, Triple H cuts a split screen promo and he says he's gonna show Marlena a real man at the 1997 Royal Rumble. So that's it guys, Ming has just been confirmed for the Royal Rumble, can't wait. Goldust and Marlena end up watching Hunter's match again from the audience and this lets Flash Funk take the early advantage. Flash takes Hunter out with a back body drop and he follows up with a... I don't even know what you call this but it looks really cool, Vince calls it a very clever manoeuvre so we'll go with that. And Flash then follows up with a sidekick that floors Triple H. Funk continues to impress with a standing moonsault, but a failed crossbody attempt finally lets Hunter go on offence for a bit. Goldust watches on as Hunter nails a clothesline and Funk gets lit up with a few chops in the corner, and Hunter then throws Funk to the outside before doing a little posing inside the ring. Flash Funk comes back into the match with a nice bridging roll up but Hunter kicks out at 2 and Triple H makes Funk pay by nailing a neck breaker. Triple H keeps an eye on Goldust and Marlena as he hits a suplex, Flash Funk fights back with a running crossbody but Hunter puts his opponent right back down with another clothesline. Hunter applies a camel clutch just before we take a break, we come back and Flash Funk reverses an abdominal stretch with a hip toss but Hunter stays on offence going on to deliver a knee drop. Hunter keeps his momentum with a suplex followed by a diving fist drop, Funk gets draped over the apron and Hunter nails his opponent, and Triple H begins toying with Flash Funk as Flash looks like he's been totally outclassed by Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Jerry Lawler then grabs a microphone and he tells Goldust and Marlena to leave the arena because they're distracting Triple H. Flash Funk begins getting the upper hand by nailing a diving crossbody, but Lawler is making so much noise that the referee has to leave the ring to keep the king under control. When the referee is dealing with Lawler, Funk hits a moonsault, and the referee's delayed count gives Triple H a chance to kick out. Funk then clotheslines Hunter over the top rope as the referee again gets distracted by Lawler, Triple H nails his opponent with the intercontinental belt, Hunter then covers Flash Funk and Triple H wins via pinfall. Goldust then begins chasing Lawler up the entranceway as Triple H tries a snake attack, Flash Funk runs out to grab Hunter, Hunter gets thrown back inside the ring and he ends up taking a 450 splash from Flash Funk. Actually found myself enjoying this one way more than I expected. Quick counters from Jericho and Benoit start us off over on Nitro and Jericho performs a back kick that knocks Benoit out of the ring. Jericho performs a drop kick while Benoit is on the apron, and Chris hits another drop kick from the top turnbuckle to the outside that almost looked more like a double foot stomp. 
As the match gets back into the ring, Tony Schiavone says that Roddy Piper has just arrived in the arena. Benoit manages to fight back with a stun gun on Jericho. Chris then hits a ridiculously high impact spinebuster on Lionheart, but Jericho kicks out of the follow up pin attempt. Benoit then goes for a powerbomb, but Jericho counters with a backslide that, unfortunately for Jericho, doesn't end the match. The two men trade chops in the middle of the ring, and Jericho manages to nail Benoit with a clothesline. And Woman watches on as Benoit manages to throw Jericho down into the middle turnbuckle. The fact that both competitors are filthy from that black powder or ash or whatever it is inside the ring is really distracting me at this point, and it really shouldn't. The Crippler lays in a few punches in the corner, but Jericho replies with an atomic drop followed by a nice super kick. Jericho goes for a land salt, but Chris moves out of the way, and this leads to Jericho fighting Benoit away from the apron. Jericho goes upstairs, he lands a crossbody, but Jericho finds himself stuck on the top turnbuckle and Benoit hits a back suplex from the top. This right here is enough to score the win for Benoit, ending a really good but really short matchup. I'll give both shows a point here, I was sports entertained on both Raw and Nitro. Mongo, Debra, and Ric Flair show up for an interview as Chris and Nancy head back up the rampway. And Mean Gene wants to talk about the miscommunication at Starcade during Benoit's match with Jeff Jarrett. Debra kicks things off by saying she's missed woman while she was gone, completely lying through her teeth. This makes Mongo jump in to defend his little princess, and subsequently, Chris Benoit gets in Mongo's face. Flair breaks up the fighting horseman, but then out comes fucking fraud. Jeff Jarrett wants to talk about Flair. The fake Double J says that Flair said Jeff was the man and he could one day be a horseman. Jarrett pinned Benoit at Starcade after Arn Anderson dropped him on his head, and so Jarrett is trying to pitch himself as a horseman here. Woman wants to know where Double A is, and Flair says he's at a hotel with a beer so cold it could freeze the hand of an Eskimo. Or Glacier. And Flair dances with Woman, he's trying to lighten the mood. Benoit tells Jared he proved himself last night, he proved that he could never be a horseman. And Benoit and Woman leave the arena as Flair continues dancing. There's clearly some problems within the horseman and the leader is seemingly ignoring these issues. The big Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels interview is up next on Raw while we have two Nitro matches. Masquerita Sagrada and Octagon Cito vs Jurito Estrada and Peritita Morgan. I'm sure I fucked up one of those names. And we also have Dean Malenko vs Rey Mysterio. Bret and Shawn get in the ring and Jim Ross is gonna ask the hard hitting questions. Ross announces a Vader vs Bret Hart match next week on Raw and Shawn says he's gonna commentate once again during a Bret Hart match and he promises, as always, he won't interfere. This gets a round of boos from the audience. Ross wants to ask Sean the first question, but Sean says he won't dare go first. A low-life degenerate like Shawn Michaels shouldn't begin this interview while the role model Bret Hart is standing in the ring. The almighty hitman should answer the first question. Bret says that this is the exact thing he doesn't like about Shawn Michaels, his whole attitude. Brett says Sean's mentor, Jose Lothario, jumped on the apron at Survivor Series and he cost Sean the WWF title, but at least Jose apologized. Brett says Sean hasn't learned a thing from his mentor, seeing as HBK didn't apologize to Brett for what happened at In Your House, it's time. Brett says he was screwed out of the title back at WrestleMania 12, and when Brett lost the match, Sean promised to carry the belt with the same pride and the same class as the Hitman. And yes, he actually did say that by the way. Long time viewers of the show will remember Sean saying this back on the April 1st 1996 episode of Raw. But well, Brett says that Sean didn't even come close to carrying the WWF belt with honour. The hitman gets a little righteous when he says his kids used to look up to Sean Michaels, but HBK scraped the bottom of the barrel when he posed for Playgirl magazine. And Brett says he doesn't think it's girls who buy that magazine. Interesting. The Hitman continues on by saying Sean degraded the WWF Championship. HBK isn't a man's man, HBK has no class, he's a disgrace, and Brett summons his inner Hulk Hogan as Sean takes off his jacket, and Brett says, quote, Sooner or later, brother, you're gonna step into the ring with me whether there's a title on the line or not. 
Brett says he's going to kick Sean's ass and this gets a great pop from the audience. It's now HBK's turn to retaliate and it gets personal right away. Sean says he's seen Brett on the road and Brett is no role model. Just as things are about to get juicy, out comes Psycho Sid to interrupt the promo. There's a broken mic getting used in the ring and check this out, Sean passes Sid a working microphone. Thank you, my man. <laughs> I don't know why, but I found that really funny. Sid says he's defeated both Brad and Sean and now he wants some real competition. The lights go out in the arena and The Undertaker's music plays. Taker comes out but he gets attacked by Vader. The dead man takes care of Vader and a stare down between Sid and the Phenom takes place but Vader blindsides Taker. Back inside the ring, Sean uses Brett's own rope against him and Brett gets his little Calgary hitman crushed. Sean then attacks Sid, and the segment fades to black as HBK and Sid fight on the entranceway. A great promo indeed, though I could have happily watched Brad and Sean verbally rip each other apart instead of Taker and Vader getting involved, but that stare down between the dead man and the WWF champion was actually really good too. We have what WCW and what the WWF would eventually call a mini match on Monday Nitro and what's interesting here is that 3 out of these 4 competitors would end up working with the WWF in just a few weeks time. I'm not going to go into a terrible amount of detail here because the next Nitro match ends up taking up most of the time for this segment but it's what you'd expect here really. A lot of arm drags, a lot of synchronised offence and a lot of surprising athleticism while Bobby Heenan cracks jokes on commentary. It's treated like an attraction match though and nothing more. Heenan calls it a riot in a daycare centre, Sagrada gets the win for his team and it ends in 2 minutes and 22 seconds. The next match though, Dean Malenko vs Rey Mysterio Jr was great and it's this match that really gives Raw a run for its money. We don't get any entrances here, straight to the action. Mysterio brings Malenko down with a leg lock but Dean counters and an STF gets applied. Keep in mind that both men lost their Starcade 96 matches so both men have something to prove tonight. An arm drag sends Dean out of the ring and Mysterio lands a head scissors from the ring to the outside. Back inside the ropes, Dean applies another STF and chin lock or not, 3 strikes and you're out pal. Ray counters a wrist lock and an arm drag takedown gets followed up with an arm bar. Ray transitions into a reverse headlock but Dean picks his opponent up and Ray gets set on the top rope. There's no big top turnbuckle move here, Ray just gets clocked with a right hand from Malenko. Dean tries to throw Mysterio to the ceiling and Ray crashes down hard. A ridiculous gutbuster from Malenko knocks the wind out of Mysterio and Ray finds himself in a half Boston Crab but he won't give up. Ray fires back by running up the ropes and nailing a dropkick though he can't capitalise afterwards. Malenko keeps the pressure on with a double underhook suplex before applying a backbreaker submission. Again, Ray refuses to give up. Another moment of hope for Ray as he counters a tilt a world with a crossbody, but Ray seems too damaged to follow up. Malenko begins making it look easy as he whips Mysterio into the corner, but Mysterio comes back with a few right hands. Ray then misses the top rope when Dean launches him overhead. Credit to Ray here though, he didn't try to climb back up like nothing happened, he sold the slip up instead. Ray gets his momentum back by reversing a back suplex with a cross body, but Malenko again shuts Ray down with a power bomb in the middle of the ring. Ray kicks out of Dean's pin attempt and he tries a few roll ups but he can't end the match. It's incredible how comfortable these two are with each other and it seems like they know what each other are thinking before each and every spot. Ray knocks Dean out of the ring with a springboard spinning wheel kick and a seated sent on from the top rope to the outside excites the audience. Inside the ropes Dean counters a west coast pop with a Boston Crab and the two then begin trading pin attempts. The crowd begin cheering as both men stop to catch their breath. The match comes to an end when Ray hits a diving Hurricane Rana, the bell rings out of nowhere, it's a time limit draw. Ray pleads for another 5 minutes with Malenko but the show moves on. I'm gonna cop out here and give both shows a point again, I genuinely enjoyed what both Raw and Nitro had to offer so yeah, points for everyone. Main event time, Goldust vs Jerry Lawler on Raw, fuck's sake. and over on Nitro we have a very short Lex Luger vs Greg Valentine match along with a Roddy Piper promo. 
The Honky Tonk Man and Triple H join Vince McMahon on commentary. Honky Tonk is gonna bang on about his talent search and Triple H is keeping an eye on Goldust. Hunter hides behind Vince when Goldust approaches the announce desk. This gives Lawler an opportunity to attack Goldust from behind and back inside the ring, Jerry lands his signature fist drop. Goldust then gets choked on the middle rope but he lets it go when the crowd begin chanting Burger King. Goldust comes back with a big right hand and Goldust brings Lawler to the opposite ropes where Marlena blows smoke into the face of the king. A jumping clothesline from Goldust floors Jerry and Goldust nails a fist drop of his own. The king turns it around while McMahon hypes up next week's Bret Hart vs Vader matchup and Triple H decides to take a walk while Goldust has his hands full with Lawler inside the ring. Triple H picks up Marlena, he walks up the ramp with her over his shoulder, but then he's stopped by the wild man Mark Merrow. As Goldust notices what's going on, Hunter throws Marlena into the arms of Merrow and then he sends Goldust crashing into Marlena. The timing of all this was absolutely spot on and the tumble Merrow and Marlena took looked like it legitimately hurt. Raw goes off the air with Triple H beating up Goldust and Merrow and yeah, the last spot was good, but the match itself was total shit. Luger vs Greg Valentine then, and again, this is an incredibly short match that doesn't even reach the 2.5 minute mark. To be fair though, I'm not sure Valentine wanted to wrestle any longer than 2.5 minutes. Lex takes a few elbows to the back of the neck and Valentine continues to punish Luger after a snap mare, keeping the focus on the total package's neck and shoulders. Luger fights back with a few rights in the corner but Valentine gets a boot up at the opposite turnbuckles and Lex goes down. The crowd chances Lex makes a quick comeback with a clothesline but Valentine manages to send Luger to the outside. Valentine gives a half hearted elbow smash from the apron to the outside and the elbow strikes continue on the apron. A running knee strike sends Luger back out of the ring. Valentine tries to bring Lex in with a suplex but the total package reverses it and we see the torture rack. It's all over and my my, this is one of the worst main events we have seen so far in this series. Why Greg Valentine was main eventing Nitro in late 1996 is beyond me, especially when you consider WCW's roster at the time. Moving on, Roddy Piper comes out immediately after the match and he's smiling from ear to ear. He gets in the ring and he thanks the crowd for the warm welcome. Piper says he's a few things he wants to say to the greatest fans in the world. The Hot Rod says Bischoff and Hogan must be living on Mars because as far as Piper can remember, Hogan got knocked out last night while locked in a sleeper hold. Piper is proud that history now reads that he is the icon and Piper says Starcade was his last match. Roddy says it was important for him to have the match but he's getting too old. And then Hogan and Bischoff make their way to the ring. The crowd continues to chant for Roddy as Hogan wants Piper to tell the truth. Piper though isn't going to lie to the fans about what happened last night at Starcade and the hot rod tells Hogan that Piper is now the icon. Hogan has to smell it, he has to eat it and Piper says Hogan has to poop it. Hulk tells the fans to shut up because he has something to say about Piper's family. Hulk continues on to say that he didn't destroy Piper last night because Roddy's son asked him to go easy on his dad. This isn't news to anybody because Hogan said this at the start of the show. Anyway, this makes Piper take his jacket off. The hot rod then has a little trouble taking off his shirt, but it doesn't matter really. The NWO hit the ring and Piper gets taken out. More NWO members begin filling up the ring but the cameras focus on the giant. Piper gets dropped on Scott Norton's knee in a great looking spot and the ring is beginning to seriously fill up with garbage as fans show their displeasure. Hogan hits Piper's repaired hip with a steel chair and give it up for Hogan here, the chair shot didn't look all that bad. But then it came time for the giant to attack Piper and to everyone's surprise, the giant refuses to perform the choke slam. The NWO back off as it looks like the giant is actually protecting Piper and as doctors bring a stretcher down to the ringside area to get Piper out of harm's way, Hulk Hogan says the giant has dropped the ball once again. Strike 1 was at Starcade, Strike 2 is now on Nitro and Hogan gives Giant his third strike with a slap across the face. Giant grabs Hogan by the throat and the big man tells the NWO to leave the ring. Hogan pleads with the Giant to let him go while agreeing to give the World War 3 winner his title shot 
and it looks like things have calmed down afterwards but Hogan tells the NWO to attack the giant. Giant takes care of Bagwell, Vincent and shit Sting but the numbers are too much and the big man takes a beating. The NWO shirt gets ripped off the giant's back and it's made clear that he's no longer part of the group. And Hogan gets a few shots in with the word belt as the NWO keep the giant held down. We see an ambulance take Piper out of the arena and Nitro fades to black. The Luger match was dreadful but the NWO stuff was good, miles better than the Lawler vs Goldust stuff, so Nitro wins the final point. Raw wins this week's Reliving the War, a very good show this week from the WWF that was unfortunately let down by a poor main event. Nitro was good too but it did feel overbooked, tons of matches but they were all pretty short with the exception being the excellent Dean Malenko vs Rey Mysterio match. Ultimo Dragon vs Jushin Lager was good too. Over on Raw the Brad and Sean stuff may have took up a lot of TV time but I found it fascinating to watch back. Our leaderboard now has 22 points for Raw, 33 points for Nitro and we've had 9 ties. Nitro won in the television ratings this week with a 3.6, Raw scored a 1.6. The dire times continue for the World Wrestling Federation. And that's the end of 1996 everyone and what a year it was. There was some horrible stuff, some industry changing stuff and a lot of mediocre stuff that we have brought back to the forefront. 1997 begins next week, a year that many consider to be one of the best years in the history of professional wrestling. Make sure you join me next week, make sure you hit the subscribe button because that helps me out a lot and if you want to see the next episode a little early have a look on my Patreon page. Have a great week guys, thank you for watching and I'll see you all next time.